Now, I know that some of you uh, are, that are regulars here are kind of going, you guys are not doing things in the right order. And you've been a little impatient to this point because, you, you, and you're feeling a little stressed if you're OCD because you're like, you guys didn't follow the program. You did two songs. We only sing one song, and then it's the children's time. <laughs> not two songs. And now we're supposed to sing some more, and you're standing up there. And we know that you don't sing. And then there's these other pastors up on the stage sitting behind you. What is going on? Well, today we're, we're concluding our series, Journey to Freedom. And uh, we pray that over the course of these last eight weeks that you've been following Christ to freedom in your life. And, and today we want to just give you a boost. We want to encourage you on your journey to freedom. And, uh, and yeah, it's going to be different, just in case you hadn't figured that out yet. Uh, I want to start out by sharing with you one of the core values at Calvary. One of the things that we hold near and dear that is, is at the very heart of why we do what we do, and, and that is this. One of our core values is character, that we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And we think one of the, the struggles or one of the failings of the church in America is that so often we as believers try to represent Jesus. We try to speak for Jesus and, and communicate Jesus to the, the people who don't know him uh, without reflecting the character of Christ. And we just think that's something we're not going to do. We don't want anyone to do because it's impossible to represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And as we grow in the character of Christ, we discover freedom and we discover life. And one of those character struggles that we often fail terribly at in church world is truth. Surprising as it may seem, uh, we struggle with truth. Now, I mean, we make sure the preachers preach the truth and, and we'll defend the truth that the Bible is the word of God, because it is. And we'll get all up in arms if somebody wants to challenge it. And we'll, we'll debate each other about the true interpretation of passages in Scripture to the point of dividing uh, fellowship over our beliefs on what truth is. But that's not enough. It's not enough just to talk about the truth. To follow Jesus is to live the truth. To follow Christ is to live the truth. And... and uh, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus said, I embody truth. I, I, I don't just represent it. I am truth. And when you follow me, you're following truth. In John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said, uh, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Yeah, we like that whole part about the truth will set you free. We, we toss that around all the time. But Jesus said, the truth that will set you free is abiding in my word. It's living in my word. It's not just enough to know the truth intellectually. It's not just enough to speak the truth. We have to live the truth if we're going to follow the one who is the truth. Which means we must be honest with God. We must be honest with God. If we're going to live the truth, we've got to be honest with God. Uh, in the letter that, uh, the first letter of John, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, beautiful verses. Listen to these. John writes, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Isn't that a beautiful verse? That if we come to God and, and, and we tell him that we're good people, that we're liars. There's no truth in us. But if we come to God and we say, God, I, I'm a failure. I've rebelled against you. I've sinned. I've disobeyed. Uh, then his mercy is poured out on us. We are forgiven of all of our sins. And, and, and we receive this cleansing in our souls. And we're qualified for heaven. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? <laughs> See, some of you are like, oh, yeah, I guess that's cool. I, I, I guess so. You know, yeah. The fact that, you know, that God sent Jesus in this world to suffer and die on the cross to pay for all of our sins. And that all we have to do is come to him and say, God, I'm guilty, and then suddenly we're cleansed of all of our sin and all of our guilt is washed away. Is not the coolest thing ever? 
I mean, that's what grace is all about. We are forgiven, and we don't deserve it. He just does it when we ask, when you and I are honest with the living God. And I grew up hearing that. I grew up being taught that, and this verse was, you know, amplified in the churches I was in. And I was like, this is so cool. I know God's grace. I know God's mercy. It doesn't matter how bad I screw up. God will forgive me. And, and, uh, and yet a lot of times it was said, all you have to do is confess to God. You don't have to be like those other churches and go confess to a man. You know, you don't have to go talk to a priest and, and sit in the closet and confess everything. You don't have to do that. Just confess it to God. And so I did. I confessed it to God, and I was forgiven of my sins, but I kept my sins secret because I didn't have to tell you about them. And because I kept my sins secret, they owned a part of me. See, Scripture that we talk about and defend as God's Word, because it is, tells us what to believe and how to live, has more than one verse about confession in it. Surprise! And so if we want to live in the truth, we have to be honest with God, but we also need to be transparent with people. Be transparent with people. See, there's this book in the Bible, the Bible, called James, chapter 5, verse 16, and James, who was also an apostle, like John, said this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That you may be healed. In other words, it's not enough to just confess your sins to God if you want to make this journey to freedom. Because when you confess your sins to God, you receive forgiveness. But if you want to be healed, you need to confess your sins to others who care about you and will pray for you and who will encourage you and will hold you accountable on your journey to freedom. By the way, that's why we encourage you to be in a life group. Life groups are so much more than just Bible study. Life groups are sharing your life with other people, small groups of people, because let's face it, you can come in here and you can confess your sins to God and keep your secrets. It's too easy to hide in the crowd, right? But if you get in a small group of people who know you and you know them, you can't hide from them. You know, you got to share your life with them. you got to go ahead and, and get to know their weaknesses and their struggles and pray for them, and they get to know your weaknesses and your struggles, and they pray for you, and they hold you accountable. And it's a very healing, powerful, healthy relationship. You see, it's called being transparent with people. And, and so if we want to have freedom, we have to live the truth. Be honest with God. Be transparent with people. And because we practice what we preach at Calvary, Today, your pastors are going to share some of our journeys to freedom. And since I'm the lead pastor, I get to go first. Amen. That's what it means to lead. <laughs> so my name is Chad Garrison, and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And there's all kinds of things I struggle with I could talk about. But one of the things that has plagued me since early in my life has been pride. I'm on a journey to freedom from pride, especially spiritual pride. Because it wasn't anybody's intention, but I was raised to be a Pharisee, to be legalistic in religion. Uh, now, I was in churches that preached grace. They said Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was raised from the dead, trust him, he'll forgive you of all your sins. And I believe that. I, In fact, I entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ when I was a child, and, and I trusted him as Savior. I, I believe that he was the, the one who paid for my sins on the cross and was raised from the dead. I made that commitment early on. But all of the standards of measuring people's spiritual life were external, non-biblical standards. You were a good Christian if you don't smoke, drink, cuss, or chew, or run with girls that do. Okay? You were a good Christian if, you know, you... Sorry, hey, those are the standards I was raised with. I don't know about your standards. You know, and I, and I was good. I measured up, so I was, you know, applauded for that. And, you know, being a good Christian meant that you showed up in church every time the doors were open and you gave money and you were a moral person. And, and, and so I, I, I followed the rules and, because I loved God. And I got applause and praise and, you know, people say, oh, he's a good Christian young man. And then at the age of 17, when I said God's calling me into ministry, you know, you might as well have just been singing the chorus of hallelujah. They shined up the halo and gave it to me because now I was holy 
er than thou. And, uh, and, and so now I'm stepping into this world of, of you know, being a minister, being a, involved in spiritual leadership, and I'm surrounded by people who are, have the same calling that I do, and, and yet I recognize that it's a world filled with hypocrisy. You know, again, we're using these, these false standards to measure people's devotion to God. Standards like, well, who has the longest quiet time and who memorizes the most scripture and, and who wins the most people to Jesus. And I did well in that competition. But I knew that there was hypocrisy because every time I looked in the mirror, I could see it. I mean, I was trying to live for Jesus the best that I could, and, and people were telling me what a great Christian I was, but I knew the evil in my heart. I knew the wickedness that was inside of me. I knew that, that there were all kinds of twisted, sick things that I wanted to do. I didn't do them, <laughs> not most of them, and, uh, but they were there. And I knew what Jesus said. If you think about it, you're guilty of it. And, and no one was talking about these things. Nobody was talking about the lust that they had or the, the anger that they had or the greed or the, uh, or, or the pride. And yet it was prevalent everywhere I looked because I saw ministers who were stumbling sexually and, and I saw ministers who were greedy and I saw ministers who <laughs> their pride and arrogance just was there for everyone to see. And as I read the word of God, and as I listened to the voice of Jesus, I said, you know what? You're calling us to honesty. You're calling us to confession. And so I started being more and more honest. Not all at once, because I liked my job. <laughs> because you see, if there's Pharisees on the stage, there's likely Pharisees in the seats. And, uh, but... I started, you know, being more and more honest. And as I, I found that as I confessed my weaknesses and my failures and my struggles, that other people identified with those. And, and not only was God working in my life, but he was lifting the burdens off of other people of guilt and shame. And, and, and these were people who were trying to live for Christ, who just felt like they couldn't measure up, but nobody was acknowledging the struggles. They, they felt like they were the only one who was struggling. And so as I saw that happen, and as I began to, Use phrases like, uh, well, I'm a scum-sucking pig sinner, because I am. That people said, hey, uh, thanks, because that resonates. I I'm one, too. Because we are. We're, we're, you know, we're guilty. We're sinners. And, 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 and we just kept upping the ante of confession and honesty here at Calvary and, until we became the church that we are now, where we are amazed at the grace and forgiveness of God, that we are delighted in his redemptive power to change lives, and we are unafraid of judgment because Christ has paid for all our sins. So I stand before you as a Pharisee, um, repentant and in recovery, and I ain't never going back. So I'm also Pastor Chad, otherwise known as the OC, uh, and in my years, I've struggled with anger, I've struggled with financial irresponsibility, I've struggled with uh, all sorts of different things, but I think my greatest struggle, and it's hard to say in front of a crowd this large, my greatest struggle in my life has been pornography. Um, it's a common struggle. Uh, according to current studies, somewhere around 90% of men and 30% of women have struggled or are currently struggling with pornography. And it's a simple fact. In today's society, it's more accessible, it's more available than it has ever been in all of history. Uh, I can get on my computer and you know, find something within a few seconds because it's just there. It's always available and easy to access. Uh, it's not like 20 years ago when you had to go to a store and buy something. Uh, you can go and do it in the privacy of your own home. It's a common struggle, but it's been my struggle. Uh, at age 10, uh, I went to a cousin's house for a sleepover, and he pulled out a pornography magazine. And from that day forward, I was hooked. I didn't understand why. I didn't understand what it was doing to my mind, but I wanted it. I wanted more of it. And parents, let me be very honest with you. Some of you are shuddering as I speak about this. But the fact is, is according to current studies, the average age of exposure to pornography is 10 years of age. 
That's the average, which means some of our kids are being exposed at age seven or eight or nine. And so the fact is, parents, if you aren't having discussions with your children, it's time to start doing that. If you haven't loaded accountability software on your devices, your computers, your phones, it's time to do that. For the sake of our kids, we need to protect them. So I was exposed at age 10, struggled with it from then on, but I really had a hard time when I got into college because now I had unlimited access to the internet. No one was watching me. No one was trying to help me out or protect me, and I dove right into it. And I struggled with it. I knew that Jesus said that uh, to look lustfully at a woman was adultery in my heart. And yet I still went into it. I still struggled with it. I still fought it. And I thought that when I got married that I wouldn't have to deal with that struggle anymore. I thought my marriage relationship would replace uh, what pornography was in my life. And I got married 10 years ago, and I hate to say it did not help. The pornography was still there. It was still very much a huge temptation in my life. And I struggled. I fought it. And I went through this vicious cycle of uh, doing really good and staying away from it for a couple of months and then slipping and falling back into it and, and then realizing what I had done and turning away from it and doing good for a couple of months and then diving right back in. And I just did that over and over and over again. And I didn't tell my wife about it because I was deathly afraid of what she would react, of how she would react. I was afraid that she would condemn me and judge me and attack me and uh, it would ruin our relationship and she might leave me. And I was scared. I lived in shame. I lived in guilt. I hid it and I struggled constantly with it because I was afraid to go to talk to anyone. Five years ago, we came here to Lake Havasu City, here to Calvary, and one of the first things that I was told as a staff member was that I was going to put accountability software on every computer that I had. And so I loaded it on my phone, I loaded it on my tablet, on my computer here at work, and I went home and started loading it on the computer at my house and sat down with my wife, and for the first time, I told Jana about the struggles that I had had for the last five years of our marriage. And I am blessed because my wife looked at me and rather than judging and condemning me and telling me that I was disgusting and I was twisted, she looked at me and blessed me and forgave me. She showed me grace. Ladies, let me tell you right now, some of your husbands are sitting in this room with my story and they're scared to death to tell you about it because they're scared that you're gonna attack them, that you're gonna judge them and condemn them and it's gonna ruin your relationship So women, I challenge you, you go put the accountability software on the computers and on the phones and you start the conversation and start it with grace and forgiveness so that your husband can open up and have a secure place to say, I am struggling, thank you for understanding, thank you for helping me to get out of this. Because here's my story. Five years ago, through the accountability software and through confession with my wife and with these guys on stage, I ha- it's been five years since I've had a serious struggle with pornography. Five years. It's been a f- journey of freedom for five years. And that journey of freedom has been amazing. It has been eye-opening. And it's given me a passion to tell the truth about pornography. I support an organization called fightthenewdrug.org, and they are a secular organization that is putting out, uh, 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 compiling scientific studies on what pornography actually does to the brain and to the body. Uh, If you don't know this, pornography, they're finding through uh, studies that have been done over the last two years, The pornography affects the brain the exact same way that cocaine affects the brain. It is a dangerous thing. It is addictive. It alters the way we think. It alters the way we communicate and have relationships. And so I have a passion to see uh, this get known, that people be aware of what it can do. I want parents to go out and put accountability software to protect their kids. I want to see men step into accountability relationships so they can step out of the dangers of pornography and step into a journey of freedom. Uh, Their uh, GQ, uh, Men's Health, have all, uh, several publications have done articles in the past 12 months about the dangers of pornography. This is not a church issue. This is a world issue that we need to confront and we need to attack head on. And it begins with us. 
So I invite you, get, gentlemen, if, if you're struggling with this, and even if you're not, it's time that we put accountability software on our computers. And if you're wondering how to do that or you want a, someone to talk to or you want an accountability partner that you can trust, guys, all four of us have the software on our stuff. And we would be more than happy to help you to walk through that. Uh, ladies, if you want some help with that, we are here available to help you if you need that. Because it's time that we stop living in the slavery that pornography has shackled us to and instead step into the journey of freedom that Christ calls us to. Hello, my name is Jesse Pruitt, and I am the worship pastor here. Um, I'm not like these guys. I don't have as much experience, so I need my notes. And also, I have a little bit of a fear of speaking publicly. I don't know if it's not having my guitar or what, but anyways. I had lots of struggles through the years uh, from partying, drinking, pride, to chasing success in the music industry for a long time. When I was younger, I grew up in San Diego, I had, a gr I had great loving parents who were Christians and raised us in church. We didn't have much, and our family had their struggles, but they always reminded us that our relationship with God, family, and our happiness was the most important things in life. Our family moved to Lake Havasu right before I started high school. I was a good kid and stayed out of trouble. I started playing music in the youth band at our church. Never had lessons for guitar or vocals, but writing original material came naturally. After graduation, I started to realize music was what I wanted to do, and it had been the start of a lifelong passion. Me and some friends started a band, and we were assigned to a record label and released an album, and we're playing with bands like Blink-182, Unwritten Law, and Face to Face, and many others. I stopped going to church, and I slowly started to party, losing my focus on Christ. At that point, God was not a priority. I still loved and believed in God, but was on my own path which eventually was a path of destruction. I was partying all the time, getting wasted, and making bad decisions. I remember uh, at one point, I was drinking so much all the time, uh, hard alcohol, that it was just changing who I was. And I, uh, a few times I remember destroying my own house, waking up to broken things and kicked in doors, and I, I'd wake up and ask my friends, hey, who did this? What happened last night? they are like, you did that, man. It's like, oh, not good. And then I remember going to the doctor later on after that, and he's like, yeah, everything looks great, except your liver, uh, liver levels are, are kind of high. It's like, okay, God, I, I need a change. As a young man, I had all these great things that I thought would make me happy, but it only left me empty inside. After five years in the band, I needed a change and moved back to San Diego for a fresh start. My uncle invited me to church, so I went not expecting anything. But when I arrived, I immediately felt God's presence and started to cry, knowing that this is what had been missing, my relationship with Christ. I felt his love, mercy, and forgiveness that night. After that, I slowly started to change everything and gave my life back to Jesus. I was going to church, joined a college life group, and started living life like God intended for me. After that, I started a band called Parker Theory that I did for about 10 years, Immediately, the band had success. Within a few months of starting the band and releasing a CD, the singer of Smash Mouth called me out of the blue one day saying he wanted to work with the band. He helped us get a manager, a lawyer, and took us on tour. At the same time, the band was getting radio play, charting number one on mp3.com, and almost every major and indie label in the industry were emailing me interested in the band. I signed a record deal in Japan, and we immediately had indie success there. I also signed a record deal in the U.S., Brazil, and Sweden. We were touring and playing with bands like Smash Mouth, Switchfoot, Jason Mraz, P.O.D., and many others. We were nominated in the San Diego and Orange County Music Awards along some of the most successful bands in the business. During this time, I was going to church, and my life was still committed to God. So I didn't fall into the entertainment lifestyle, but I was buying into the music industry's success. Everyone around me... I was working with, we're talking about fame, money, and success. I never cared about the money because it was my passion, but I wanted to take care of my family and started putting everything into becoming successful. My definition of success was different than what God had for me. My priorities were becoming messed up, and God and my family were not number, my number one priority. 
During all of this, I was offered several amazing opportunities to lead worship at great churches in San Diego. But I kept saying, one day, God, one day I'll do that. But part of it was because I, I felt like I didn't have my life together enough. And growing up, I thought that you almost had to be perfect, not realizing that no one is perfect and we all have struggles. After having children, I, I knew my life needed to change again. And my focus needed to be more on my family. But again, I felt lost because I put so much into being successful in music that I didn't know where to go next in my journey. So I asked God to lead me and my family into the right direction. During that time, doors started to open uh, for a career in acting. I had a good relationship with Lionsgate through licensing my music to their films, and they started helping me to get small speaking roles in feature films and getting my SAG card. We now had a decision to move to Los Angeles or be close to our family here in Arizona. I went to Lake Havasu to write and record an original score and soundtrack for a feature film with my friend TJ. And while I was here, another friend who is going to Calvary called me and said I should apply for the worship leader position for this church. I was very hesitant, and me and my wife never thought we would move back to Havasu. <laughs> but I felt something tugging me to reach out to them, so I did, and we met. I was unsure of moving back to Havasu, and I think they were unsure if I was the right person for the position. <laughs> a few months later, we kept in touch, and they asked me to be an interim, so I decided to do it. Within a few months, I knew this is where I was supposed to be and what God was leading me to do. So in faith, me and my family moved to Lake Havasu, and I ended up getting the full-time worship leader position. After a bit, Pastor Sean, who is the worship pastor, uh, left to take on his own church, and I took on his position. I am so thankful that I put my trust in God and surrendered my life to him because he has blessed my family in so many ways, and I thank him daily for that. It's so cool because I, I got invited back to go to Japan again a couple weeks ago, so I, me and my buddy Joseph Pfeiffer went back there, and uh, we got to meet with all the people from my record label and all these uh, different people in the industry, and we both got to share God with them, and it was incredible. We also, on the other end, got to play at churches and, and schools and festivals and lead worship there, and a lot of the uh, pastors were saying, hey, a lot of these people have never heard God, and it's really cool that you guys get to share, and I'm like, what an amazing opportunity to turn things around and now share my life story and God to them. Same with Lionsgate and all the other things. God's still opening doors and, and letting me be creative. I got to make a worship record, and it's just so incredible. Uh, several times through my life, people thought I was living the dream, but I found real success and purpose in serving God and playing for Christ more satisfying than anything else I had ever done. And now, as of a month ago, I am a worship pastor. I'm Chad Anderson, the executive pastor at Calvary Baptist Church with a focus on life group and adult education. And I guess, according to uh, Pastor Chad's definition, if you smoke, drink, chew, cuss, and go with girls that do, then you are totally disqualified. <laughs> not the, the part that go with girls that do, though. I don't want to cast any shame on Miss Claudia. She is not here for that. And I guess they saved the worst for last, right? I, uh, I went through a lot in my life growing up. Most of you have heard that. If you haven't heard that, I'd be glad to sit down with lunch or dinner or appointment with you and share uh, in those areas. Struggle with uh, anger issues, uh, alcohol abuse. Um, but at the tender age of 18, I was in what I call my born-again, rebellious, stupid stage and decided to move out of the house uh, that I was living in because I didn't like the authority that was in the house. I didn't like what was happening to me, and it was pretty strict on discipline in, in certain areas. Well, if you come from something that's really strict and then all of a sudden you realize that you have no restrictions on you, you try lots of fun things. And sometimes some of those fun things attach themselves to you and you can't shake them back off of you. One of those was I started a habit called smoking. Um, it wasn't uh, illegal. Well, um, most of it wasn't illegal uh, sources. Most of it was Marlboro Light 100s. 
And uh, I enjoyed smoking because I grew up in a household uh, of, of a smoker. We, we actually lived in the house where my dad smoked in the house. And when we drove in the car, dad smoked in the car and we did all of those things. So um, I, I smoked. And then I found out after being married that our first child was on the way. And, you know, hearing the reports, seeing the commercials, especially the one that sticks in my mind is the, the dad and the little son that are walking down. And it's a really old commercial. Most of you probably don't remember it. But they sit down, and there's a pack of cigarettes that's right between the two of them. And the question is, wh- wh- how, basically, are you going to influence your child? And I, and I got to thinking about that. I, first of all, I didn't want to poison my child. Second of all, I didn't want my child smoking. I, I just didn't. So I quit for six years. No problem. Whoosh. No more smoking. And then I went through a horrible divorce when I was 30 years old and decided that smoking would be a thing for me to get back into. It took me one month, a whole month, with the first pack of cigarettes that I bought from there to re-engage in smoking. But then I was totally hooked. For 16 years, I was hooked on nicotine. I enjoyed smoking, and I didn't want anybody to tell me that I shouldn't smoke. I I saw a movie one time that says, if you're a smoker, smoke. If you're not, don't. And I figured I was a smoker, so I was going to smoke. Now, my kids would go to school, and they would come home every time they had those health fairs. And and they would be screaming and hollering, telling me, Dad, do you know what your lungs look like? We saw it in class today, and you're going to die. Please stop smoking. I don't want to talk to you about this. Don't ask me to quit smoking. And then, of course, my wife, obviously, wanting me to be healthier, would go on a campaign every now and then and say, Chet, honey, you really, you, you really need to quit smoking. And, and I would say, honey, remember when you married me, I was smoking? We're still married, and it was okay when you married me, so get off my case. Let me smoke. And then I started down that journey of saying, I really want to quit smoking. I really don't want to be addicted to nicotine. It wasn't my decision to quit wasn't based on the fact that when I smoke that typically you wind up smelling like a goat. (laughs) Or that you increase the chances or the odds of you contacting or getting some form of cancer. Those were not the reasons whatsoever. The reason was this. I had allowed the nicotine, the cigarette, to become an idol to me. And this is what actually happened. I would get real angry, real excited, real intense, and I could go outside, throw a Marlboro Light in my mouth, fire it up, and in just a couple of puffs, ah, nice and calm. And some of you are sitting there going, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. Been there, done that, or still doing it now. I got a little tap on the shoulder that said, you know, Chet, you've allowed nicotine to take my place in your life. It wasn't for health reasons that I quit. It wasn't because my my family just was begging me to quit. It wasn't because I was a minister of the gospel that it was a bad example that I wanted to quit. It was because God convicted me through the Holy Spirit that what I was doing was replacing him with something that was false. And at that time, I quit. And I quit at a very appropriate date because I wanted to remember this date. Some of you that have smoked a long time can tell me exactly what date, how many years, how many months, how many hours, how many minutes. I can't tell you all that. I can tell you it was on April the 1st. And I think it was in 07. I'm not positive. But it was April 1st. April Fool's Day, right? So in the event that if I ever thought about taking another drag from a cigarette or a pipe or a cigar or putting a dip in my mouth, I would be the biggest fool that I knew. And that was a reminder of me. And I have journeyed since 07 totally 100% nicotine free. Now, according to James chapter 5, here is the deal. It says we confess our sins to one another. And there was two or three or four men in the congregation that knew I was smoking. They were praying for me. And I confessed that to them, and they prayed for me. But then when I publicly confess it to you, that's my confession to you. But it also says for us to pray for one another. And some of you sitting in this room right now, at the same place that I was, I'd look in that mirror and pray, God, please take this from me. And I want to pray for you right now. Father God, 
We come to you recognizing that you are the ultimate authority in our lives, and we invite your Holy Spirit, Lord, not, not Chet's spirit, but you, God, your spirit, to redeem the lives of those that are sitting here that have formed any type of addiction, but especially addiction to nicotine, God. Break that bondage from their lives. Father, release them from that control, that desire, that want to have nicotine in their body and break that away from them, God. And we'll be sure and give you the praise and the honor. And Father, we'll honor you in letting folks know that it was you, God, that healed us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Obviously, we stand before you as flawed and broken men that God has redeemed and allowed the privilege of serving him. And uh, we're on a journey to freedom. And we want to invite you to join us on that journey to freedom. Maybe you're here and you've never even trusted Christ as Savior. You've never taken that step. And you just kind of sense that God is calling you to commit to him uh, for the first time forever. And we're just going to encourage you to do that because there is life and there is forgiveness and there is freedom in Christ. It just begins when you say, Jesus, I surrender. Or if you're a follower of Christ, what is God calling you to do for that next step on your journey to freedom? You know, uh, are you being honest with God? Are you being transparent with people? Are you living the truth? Because you have to live the truth if you want to be free. Will you pray with me? Father, today we thank you that you have loved us and that you've given us life through Jesus. And we just want uh, to live the truth. We want uh, to know the freedom that you came to give us. And we know you paid the price for our sins through the sacrifice on the cross. And we are thankful for that. So, Lord, today draw us into an honest conversation with you and give us the courage to, uh, to be transparent with someone in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.